Welcome everyone to this historical overview of the Parish Church of All Saints, Aston on Trent. People occasionally ask me, how old is the church? Which of course is a very, very difficult question to answer as the present building has, uh, has come into being in its present state over quite a number of years, which is something that we'll explore together as we look around the church. What we can say is that as we look at the church, apart from the Victorian porches, we're seeing the church pretty well as it would have looked around the year 1500. Our journey together starts in the northwest corner of the church, right adjacent to the tower. If we look at the wall there, we can see set into the wall a stone of Anglo-Saxon origin, most probably the shaft of a preaching cross. If we go back to the 7th century, when Christianity first came to the Kingdom of Mercia, um, we remember that the centre for mission, the, what we call the Minster Church for this area, was of course the community of monks at Repton. So we can well imagine that monks would travel from Repton, come along downstream to the um, to here to Aston on Trent, and a preaching cross would have been set up where people could gather together for worship. They were often wood in a stone base, but here there seems to be evidence of quite a substantial and ornate preaching cross dating back to the end of the 7th century. Underneath the preaching cross, just as interesting but not as well known, is what seems to be the edge of a former building, long before the North Isle was added. It would seem that this is the remains of an Anglo-Saxon building. We can tell this by the pattern of stones. It was quite normal for Anglo-Saxons when they built in stone, they're, they're more commonly built in wood, but when they were building in stone, they would use at the corners and the doorways this long and short pattern. A long stone, a short stone, a long stone, a short stone. As I say, it's unusual to find evidence of a stone building from Anglo-Saxon times, as many Anglo-Saxon buildings were made of wood. Um, as this area was very much Danish country, in the end of the 9th uh, and the 10th centuries, uh, Derby being one of the five Danish burrs, um, this building, the church, probably therefore must be either very early, uh, rather in the same sort of era as, um, as the chancel at St Whiston's in Repton, or late, I think it's more probable that it's late, uh, dating from around the end of the, uh, the 10th century or around the, the millennium. Down at ground level you can see very much the corner base of the building, which would have been small and box-like with very small windows and a steep pitched roof. If we stand back and have a look at the tower, what we're looking at there is a rather impressive Norman tower from about the year 1100, or certainly the bottom three quarters of it is. It was not built to house bells, it was built to be a sort of strategic symbol that the Normans had arrived, uh, particularly being so close to the junction of the Trent and the Derwent. The top part of the, of the tower, uh, the top quarter or so, uh, going from just above where the, uh, where the clock now is, um, you can see a change in the stonework, from the Norman stonework below to stonework which was added in the 14th century in order to incorporate a bell tower. If we zoom in a little bit more closely, we can see the transition uh, between the Norman tower and the later addition. Uh, the, the level of the stonework on this side, on the north side, is, is very much level with the bottom of the uh, louvered uh, bell chamber windows which were part of the 14th century structure. You can see the see the change there of the stonework. On the north, the south and the west sides you can see these lovely Romanesque windows uh, which probably originally didn't contain any glass and would have let only a very small light into the interior of the church. On the west end of the tower we can see where the original west doorway was. Um, it, this had got into bad repair, the original Norman doorway, uh, and so in the 18th century, in the Georgian period, um, this doorway was blocked up, uh, a new archway was put in for the door, and it was made into a sort of storage area, about sort of 18 inches deep. Um, last year we opened it up again and glazed it to make more of a feature of this old doorway. Just above the west doorway we can see... Um, 
what's called known as a lancet window, an example of the beginning of the Gothic early English style of architecture, dating from the end of the 12th century, and this window would probably have been glazed. Moving inside the church, we can see the base of the Norman Tower quite clearly, uh, in including this rather impressive Norman archway, which indicates that we certainly would have been a substantial Norman church here on this site. We can only imagine what the Norman church might have looked like. There would have been pillars down the sides, there would have been a, a round archway, long lost, uh, leading into the chancel. And the chancel would probably have had a semicircular east end, what we call an apse. Looking above the archway, we can see a fascinating and rather interesting little doorway high up on the east side of the tower. This was probably on the inside of the church and gave access to the upper part of the tower. There would probably have been a ladder and then a little gallery above it, which of course could be taken down for defensive purposes, which meant if the church, the church tower needed to be defended, um, having that as the only access to the upper part of the tower would be quite significant defensively. Traditionally placed at the west end of the church is of course the font, uh, the font here dating from around the end of the 12th century. It's particularly interesting in that uh, this font has a little slit cut into the side of the upper part of the stonework, um, which would enable parishioners to be able to, um, as they came into church, to be able to dip their hands under the lid and reach the holy water inside and make the sign of the cross on their forehead. At the side of the uh, Norman arch, um, there was seen to be on the wall here a consecration mark, which is marking the spot where the bishop would have made the sign of the cross in order to consecrate the Norman building. On the north side of the arch, where the opposite side, we can see some apotropaic markings. These were markings that were quite common uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, quite a common practice to, to mark the stones in order to ward off evil spirits. Uh, very popular were crisscross patterns which were intended to confuse the evil spirits and there are quite a lot of examples of them around the church. Also these hexagonal and triangular markings, one uh, under the tower and this other one at the side of the chancel just above the choir stalls. And inscribed onto the side of some of these old pews, this isn't uh, graffiti, this again is apotropaic markings. You can see an R and occasionally there's some M's or upside down M's which stands for Maria Regina, Maria Mary the Queen of Heaven. Um, again intended to invoke uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary um, against the evil spirits. And take a look at the locks on the both doors, both the south and the north doors, doors of the church, the locks have been put in upside down. The key has to be inserted upside down, which was intended to confuse the devil, who apparently was not very intelligent and quite easily confused by such devices. As we stand at the west end and look back into the nave, we can see quite clearly the 13th century arcade belonging to the early English Gothic period. They were put there, those pointed arches and, and the pillars would have replaced the Norman ones that were already there. Also in the 13th century, a new Gothic chancel arch would have replaced the old Norman one. Also, looking above the chancel arch, you can see the pitch of the original roof, which would have been much more high-pitched than the present one. Originally, beyond the arcades, the side aisles would have been quite small, just enough room for somebody to walk down. The north aisle was extended at various times. It was extended first in the 13th century, then the 14th, and finally it was made higher in the 15th century. We can tell all this by looking at the outside of the aisle. This wall has to be the most interesting bit of wall in the whole of the church. We talked about the preaching cross, we talked about the Anglo-Saxon corner of the building, but there's evidence here of the extension of the north aisle. The stones at the right hand side are very different from the stones on the left hand side. And the ones under the roof seem to have been added even later. It's amazing what you can tell by studying stones. But do excuse the bins. 
If we wander further down the north side of the church, you can see quite clearly how the sides of the church were originally much shorter and how when the roof was raised to incorporate the present windows, extra stonework was added above it. These present uh, windows, square windows, dating from probably around 1500 um, were added um, and you can just about see the line of the original Gothic windows um, that were obviously taken out and replaced. Having seen how the North Isle has evidence of being added to and extended over the generations, it's very interesting to move now to the South Isle and see how this is all of one piece. It's much more spacious and much grander with a, with a flatter roof. The South Isle dates from the mid to late 14th century. And of course on the south side it contains these two wonderful glorious windows belonging to the decorated Gothic style. Called decorated because of course of the elaborate uh, flower-like tracery at the top of the windows. The easterly of these two windows is particularly interesting for having these niches on either side which were designed to house statuary which of course would have been removed post-reformation. At the base of these niches is some lovely carved detail. Uh, on one hand we've got uh, three crowned figures. Do they represent the three kings or is it a representation of the trinity? On the other side we have a depiction of the tree of life. Uh, lots of roots and branches all mingled together. Visitors to the church of all ages are always fascinated by the little doorway and the spiral staircase which seems to go absolutely nowhere. It does of course go somewhere. If you look above the Victorian pulpit you can see a little doorway high up to which the spiral staircase led. It was quite common in the Middle Ages to have what was called a rood screen separating the nave from the chancel separating the community part of the church from the sacred part. Some of these screens occasionally had a, a loft, a rude loft, to which the stairway would have given access. And on the loft stood the rood, which of course is an Anglo-Saxon name for the cross. There would have been Jesus on the cross, flanked by St John and the Blessed Virgin Mary. At the beginning of the 15th century, the clear story was added to the church. That was a, an extra row of windows at the top of the nave, allowing extra light into the church. That would have meant, of course, that the roof would need to be raised. So we have a, a much shallower pitched roof uh, on the nave uh, nowadays. And you can see, of course, as we noticed earlier above the chancel arch, the uh, line of the original uh, pitch of the steep pitch roof that was there before the clear story was added. The end of the 14th century marked a massive social change in England. Feudalism was already on the wane and we saw the rise of the middle classes, the local minor gentry. Here in Aston we have a rather splendid tomb of local gentry from the early 14th century, Thomas and Agnes Tickhill. Thomas Tickhill was a lawyer, he wears lawyer's robes and a lawyer's cap and he has a rather splendid, he and his wife had a rather splendid tomb made in the local Chelliston alabaster workshops. We know that because the side of the tomb bears the trademark of the local alabaster workshops in Chelliston, the angel, that particular design of angel bearing a shield. At their feet of course there's a greyhound which was a symbol of faithfulness, uh, sadly long decapitated. The reason for the building of side aisles, which we've just been talking about and discussing, yes they, they let more light into the church, they gave more space in the church, um, but they also housed, were designed to house side chapels. And side chapels were by and large chantry chapels. They were designed for priests to be paid by their benefactors to say mass for their souls after they, after they died. Uh, masses for their souls in purgatory. The tomb of Thomas and Agnes was not originally in this location, it was more probably under the arch at the side of the chancel uh, where the organ at the moment stands. 
Moving into the chancel now, we can see the same effect as in the nave. The roof was raised in the 15th century to let in more light and to allow this lovely perpendicular style east window to be installed. Uh, the perpendicular style was a much more flattened arch. On the north side of the chancel you can see the clear story windows. One of these clear story windows would seem to have the only remnant of medieval glass in the building, uh, an angel carrying a shield. Uh, the rest of the medieval glass that would have been in the windows during the Middle Ages was of course uh, vandalised, removed post-Reformation. On the south side of the chancel, instead of a clear story, they extended the windows to create these gloriously tall windows, probably dating from the Tudor period, which let much more light and colour into the church. Peeping over the choir stalls on the south side would seem to be the remains of a squint, which was a little window which would allow people outside to have a view of the Mass being celebrated at the altar. If you're able to crane your neck for a moment and look up at the roof of the chancel, you'll see a lovely timber roof from the dating from the 15th century with very ornate bosses, including right in the middle um, a figure of a green man or the head of a green man, which of course was a pre-Christian symbol of fertility. And also these stone corbels with lovely angel figures carved on them. Above the rector's stall we have a board listing the incumbents from around, from the 14th century right through to me in two, from 2002. However, there are two mistakes on the board. First of all, there are two incumbents missing from the list from the 16th century. Also, the title is rather misleading because it says Rectors of Aston on Trent All Saints Church. Um, until the Reformation, the benefice was in the hands of the Abbey of Chester. So the abbot of Chester would have been the rector, the one with the right of income from the land. Um, he would have appointed vicars or representatives to do the pastoral work for him. So until the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1540s, um, the priests here would have been vicars. Post-Reformation, however, they became rectors in their own right. They were able to draw the income from the lands of the benefice, which would have been considerable in a farming community like Aston-on-Trent. Uh, nowadays, it's just a historic title. The northeast corner of the chancel shows signs of the restoration that took place in mid-Victorian times. The Holden family, who lived at Aston Hall at that time, well, from the late 17th century onwards, uh, paid for the restoration of the church. Fortunately, All Saints escaped the damage which some Victorian restorations, in inverted commas, inflicted on medieval churches. However, a lot of the stone here in this corner of the church needed replacing. The archway was blocked off between the chancel and the North Isle Chapel. Set into the stonework between the sanctuary and the North Isle is another more elaborate consecration mark uh, from the Middle Ages. Uh, it probably was originally on the north wall of the chancel and it was moved onto the pillar when the stonework was replaced in Victorian times. We have evidence all around the church of the families who lived at uh, Aston Hall and who endowed the church at various times in its history. Uh, the Tickhills, the Hunts, the Holdens and the Winterbottoms. Um, beneath the high altar, you don't very often get a chance to see it because it's covered by a frontal, is a very fine Jacobean altar table that was donated by the Hunt family, um, who were lords of the manor here in the, uh, in the 16th century. Uh, this particular table bears a dedication. It's written, it's inscribed under it, carved into the, the oak, uh, that it was a gift of John Hunt in 1630. The Holden family became the local squires at the end of the uh, 17th century, and underneath the altar, Again, largely unseen, is some inscriptions to some of the early Holdens. Um, we're guessing that there must be a vault uh, underneath the east end of church, and these are names of people who are buried there. In the Middle Ages, the nave of the church was usually a, an empty space. It didn't have any pews in it. Pews were only really introduced uh, post-Reformation, when people were expected to sit and listen to the service uh, that was going on. 
Um, the, we have here in the in the nave at uh, at All Saints an example of some Tudor pews, uh, very chunky oak pews. Um, we saw some of the inscriptions that had been put on them earlier on, um, but also of note are the little holes in the top of some of the pews, which were probably used for inserting either a candle or a rush light um, uh, when people had come to church in the darkness. Some people think that organs have always been around in church, but actually they were not uh, introduced into ordinary parish churches like All Saints until uh, mid-Victorian times at least. Uh, before that time, uh, worship was accompanied by uh, bands of instrumentalists. Um, we've got here on the, uh, under the tower, uh, in a cabinet, uh, an oboe and, a, and a, a bassoon dating from around 1750. Uh, we've had experts look at those and uh, the bassoon is made by Mulhouse of Newark, again in the middle of the, uh, the 18th century. Um, so evidence of, uh, of worship before the introduction of or an organ. I mentioned how in the 1860s and 70s uh, restoration was done to the church by the Holden family, or sponsored by the Holden family anyway, um, they, as well as uh, repairing a lot of the stonework, adding the porches to the outside of the building, they also uh, inst had installed, commissioned and had installed this wonderful reredos behind the, uh, the altar, uh, it, the matching pulpit uh, and also the choir stalls and altar rail. Moving now to the beginning of the 20th century, we've got two fine stained glass windows uh, in the south aisle. Um, for the first one is uh, in mem given in memory of James Shuttleworth Holden, who was the rector here for 47 years and died in 1916. The window depicts Christ, the Good Shepherd, in the middle, flanked by scenes from Christ's nativity and resurrection. Uh, but the most interesting thing about the window is the details at the bottom. In the bottom uh, left-hand corner, we can see a detail of a young Reverend James Shuttleworth Holden baptising a baby uh, at the font at the back of church. And at the bottom right-hand corner, we can see a bearded, much more older uh, Reverend James uh, distributing communion at the high altar. And one of the communicants is uh, a soldier in First World War dress. The Reverend James must have been a very popular rector, as I say he was rector for 47 years because as well as this window uh, donated by his family, we also have, of course has the Lich Gate uh, which was given by grateful parishioners in his memory. At the west end of the North Isle we have this window which was uh, dates from about the 1870s, given in memory of uh, two members of the Holden family and it uh, depicts the resurrection, Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene on Easter morning and uh, it's very reminiscent of the sort of pre-Raphaelite style of, uh, of, of painting, uh, rather a fine piece of Victorian stained glass. The finest example of stained glass in the church is undoubtedly the window in the south aisle, which was given in memory of Major Guy Winterbottom, uh, who died uh, in 1917 during the First World War at uh, Salonica. Uh, the window depicts uh, St Michael on the left, St George on the right, with the Angel Gabriel appearing to Mary in the centre. The stained glass window comes from the workshop of Charles Kemp, who was a famous uh, London um, stain ma manufacturer and designer of stained glass. Uh, Kemp himself died in 1907, but his company continued until 1934. Um, its trademark, which you'll find in the bottom left-hand corner of the window, was a golden wheat sheaf. The Winterbottom family lived in uh, Aston Hall at the beginning of the 19th century until the, uh, the estate was sold off in 1924. And we have another monument on the um, south side of the ch chancel uh, to Major Guy Winterbottom describing how he was killed in action in Salonica during the First World War. Amongst the various monuments on the inside and on the outside of the church you will find some to the Salisbury family, particularly from the, uh, the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, including this vault on the north side of the church with tablets on the walls and obviously the uh, uh, where you can see the remnants of where there must have been railings to, to screen it off from the rest of the churchyard. Particularly interesting in that the Salisbury family from Cavendish Bridge, which is part of Shardlow. Um, and of course Shardlow until the 1830s was uh, part of Aston-on-Trent Parish before it became a parish in its own right with the growth of the canal industry. Um, so the Salisbury's were obviously a well-to-do family from, uh, fr from Shardlow uh, who had monuments and, uh, and were interred in the fact they even had their own vault here at All Saints. 
I'm sure you'll all agree that All Saints is a fascinating historical building, but in no ways is it a museum, but it's a, it's a building, it's a church, it's a place of worship that's used by a living community here in All Saints, and we continue looking at ways in which we can use it and adapt it more effectively. Uh, in the 1990s, for instance, this uh, screen was put across the arch under the tower in order to create a, a room under the tower, which in particular is used for as a children's area, uh, so children can play there, uh, join services and at other times. And most recently, we've improved access to the church and within the church for disabled people. Um, and also we've, uh, we've installed this nave altar uh, so that the uh, celebration of communion is much closer to the congregation. Um, this uh, altar and lectern were um, made by a local craftsman, Roger Twig, and donated in memory of members of the former members of the congregation. Thank you very much for joining me on this tour. I do hope you enjoyed it.